And so Jesus could restore Peter for denying the Messiah. I mean, this is someone that he spent three and a half years with that had, you know, intimate conversations of the things of God. Prayer, the great example is right there face to face with you, and yet you deny him. And, and even then Jesus restored him. That is the ultimate form of forgiveness. And so there's a verse here at the end in verse 25, and it says, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. This particular verse, and this is within the passage that talks about the beloved disciple and his book. This particular verse, verse 25, talking about all of the many things that Jesus did. This goes to show that, you know, sometimes people have questions, especially for those out proclaiming the good news of the gospel or just sharing the word, you know, different scriptures. And so people will have many questions and, and they'll say, well, why is this or why is that? They're almost unsatisfied with the idea that as much as we love our God and we love our Christ and we follow him, doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to know each and every thing. This is a testament to that. As a matter of fact, here's another example. The Bible talks about in the New Testament, I believe it's in Acts, if I'm not mistaken, where it talks about the Holy Spirit. Maybe it's in one of the later books of the New Testament. Please excuse me for that. But it talks about the Holy Spirit praying in a language that only God knows. Okay, I'm simplifying it. But, you know, if, if you Google it, you'll see the scripture that I'm talking about. Well, why is that an example? And how does that correlate to verse 25? They mesh together because it shows a testament of how great our God is, that as much as he has revealed to us, we will still never know everything about our God. He is too magnificent. His power, his omnipotence is so great. It is so vast. It is almighty. He truly is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. We cannot ever, in our minds, in this conscious mind that we have, there's no way to fathom the great possibility of our God. And so unless it's according to his will, you're not going to understand it. Unless he inclines you through the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, you're not going to know. It is all up to our God because he knows best. He knows what we can handle and what we cannot handle. He knows what is for our betterment, for our greater good. And so this is why we have to keep that hope and that faith in him. We have to trust in our God and King for each and everything because our God knows best. Our Christ is guiding us, and he will never steer us wrong. So as I continue on, it goes on in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, where Satan attempts Jesus. Here in this passage, it's talking about Jesus being out in the wilderness. It's talking about him fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, and so, you know, we can see here again that no matter who, came before our Christ, even Satan himself, who already is damned to hell. His fate is sealed for what he has done against God and against the people of God and how he comes to corrupt and devour like a roaring lion. And for the tempting of Jesus, he, he is already condemned. But here you can see that even though Jesus had the power and the authority to do whatever it is that he needed to do to satisfy in the scripture it says afterward he was hungry after he fasted for the 40 days and 40 nights he was hungry jesus could have snapped his finger he could have just proclaimed it with his his mouth and he could have been filled with bread with water with whatever he wanted yes he could have commanded the angels to come but jesus was obedient he kept the things of God holy and he did not defile it. He was bold and he stood strong for the word of God. 
And so here's an example of how we need to stand strong for God, that in the midst of opposition, in the midst of temptation, in the midst of someone trying to get us to prove something to them, we have to stand firm and stand uh, within that boldness because we don't depend on ourselves, we depend on our God and our King. We don't need to get caught up in being proud, proud of the giftings, proud of the fruits of the Spirit. We don't need to be proud of that. Why? Because all of the glory forever and ever belongs to our God and King. It does not belong to us. We are merely vessels of the Most High God. All good comes from Him and through Him. And so here's that great example that we should stand firm on the Word of God, that Jesus has completed the finished work. He has fulfilled the law and the prophets. He has sealed the covenant. He has fulfilled the, the prophecies. And we're still seeing those prophecies come uh, to fruition today because he sealed them for the past, the present, and the future. And so let us not get caught up in pride, but have humility like our Jesus did. And let us not be tempted to do things just because we have fleshly need. Let us not give in to our fleshly desires, if you will, because what happens? Then we revert back. Then we step outside of the goodness of God. Then we separate ourselves from Him because of that sin. We don't need to debate the Word of God, and we don't need to prove the Word of God because what God has done, what God has allowed to be uh, uncovered and shown both within our regions and all over the world and how the Holy Spirit has touched many lives and lives in the, in the followers of Christ. We don't need to debate with someone who doesn't know the Bible. We don't need to debate with someone who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, they're blinded and they are deaf to the things of God. Now, if you are inclined through the Holy Spirit to speak to them, to speak into their life, then trust that God will break that thing that is within them, that is keeping them as a prisoner in their own sin, as a prisoner in their own mind that is warring against them. And so as I move on in Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 46, it talks about the prayer in the garden. It, it talks about Jesus going and praying by himself. And although he asked the disciples a few times to, as a matter of fact, let me just read the, the scripture. I don't want to speak out of out of the context here. It's in verse 40, it says, Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is the, the context and the conversation that Jesus was having when he came and found the disciples giving in to their flesh. Now, I just read for you the previous passage where it talks about Satan tempting Jesus and how Jesus did not give in to any flesh because the flesh is weak. He did not give in to temptation, which is what the, the devil was trying to uh, prompt him with. Okay, getting to tempt him to see if there was any type of pride or anything. But see, the devil is not smart. No, not at all. The devil has no wisdom. The devil is set apart from the things of God. So how could he know the vast omnipotence of the Most High, of the Most Holy, of the Son of God, who is to be honored as we honor the Father, who has been given the authority for judgment? Here he is saying to the disciples, as a matter of fact, to Peter, you cannot watch with me one hour. So you will see from this we're talking about personality traits and I hope that you're starting to make the connection as I'm going through these different uh, scriptures these different stories about the ministry of Jesus in these instances these are examples of how he dealt with these situations what he did what he said let that be your great example here we find that he went off on his own and he prayed alone and that even though these uh, disciples gave in to the temptation of, of their flesh being weak and that their bodies were tired and they fell asleep, they gave in to it. They couldn't even watch and pray for one hour. They fell asleep, they gave in to it. Here we see that Jesus still 
was bold and obedient and willing to do the things of the Father. We see where he is praying to the Father and he asked the Father, if, if it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me. But he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What, is, what was Jesus saying to the Father, to his Father, to our Father? Glory be to Jesus. We can say that this is our Father and we can pray to God just as he prayed to God. It's saying, it's not according to my will. Even though I ask you if it's possible, if it's in your will to take this cup from me. And Jesus says, nevertheless, not according to my will, but according to your will, Father. I will endure. I will be obedient to the things of you. And so in John chapter 18, it talks about the betrayal and the arrest and gets money. And we know with the persecution of Christians, we this is nothing new. Jesus said, if if they do this to me, they'll do this to you. I'm just putting it in simplified terms here. We've seen the things that Jesus has gone through, the persecution that he has gone through. And now, according to God's will, he's allowing them to come and arrest him. And I say that because there are other areas within Jesus' ministry where when he spoke of the things of God, when he proclaimed the word, when he brought correction, when he revealed the sinful nature of those who were children of the devil, at that time they were seeking to devour him. At that time they were seeking to do these horrible things. But Jesus was removed from the midst of them. And so now here he's allowing them to arrest him because now is the appointed time. And even though he was left alone by his disciples, they all ran off, everyone ran off to their own corner and gave into their flesh and was afraid. They did not stand for, for our, our God and King. Even though Peter denied Jesus, Jesus could have called legions of angels and yet he proclaimed to them and said, I am he, I am he. He was strong, he didn't back down, he stood for what was right. And in the midst of persecution, he did not wander, he did not backpedal, he did not change his story, he did not twist and change the word of God. No, he stood for what was righteous and true because he is righteous and true. And so may we all be as bold. May we not be afraid. May we exude the strength of our God and King. And so that entire chapter goes on to explain the trial, the denial of Jesus, when Jesus went before the high priest, when he was questioned, he went to Pilate's court, talks about all of that. Also, and I'll do a podcast on this in the future, it talks about uh, how the people, when they were distinctly asked who they wanted to have released at the Passover, do you want the king of the Jews released? And they all cried out again saying, not this man, not the king of the Jews, but Barabbas. Right now I'm just researching. I had the video for it for a future podcast, but there's a particular video that breaks down the meaning of Barabbas as it is used in this scripture. And so here again, at the very last minute, the Jews, the people who came, the religious people who sought to kill Jesus had one last chance to choose Jesus. And they chose not the son of God, but the son of man. You know, I'll do a podcast on that to really break down the details of it. It's very interesting. But the point is, is that if you read through that entire chapter, you will get a very good idea of the type of personality that all of us really have. It may not shine through at every single moment. Maybe that's not the dominant feature in our personality, but in the midst of trial and tribulation, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of defamation, that will most certainly shine through because of the Holy Spirit. When you follow our Christ and our God, that boldness will exude and you will stand for truth. You will stand for what is righteous and true because God's word is truth. And when you know that you're standing for truth, you're willing to put your life on the line. You're willing to put everything on the line 
for the one that has given you life and who will sustain that life and who gives eternal life, the one that has the power to bring that second death, the one that has the power to, to raise our Christ from the dead. So now, uh, before I close, I also wanted to bring up Matthew chapter 18. I know I'm in the book of Matthew a lot, and I really didn't even realize it until now that I'm going over it. But, you know, hey, if that's where the Lord wants us to be today, that's where we'll be. So in the book of Matthew chapter 18, verses 2 through 4, it talks about children, personality traits of Jesus. Jesus loves children. As a matter of fact, he said, heaven is for the children. And it says uh, in this scripture, and just like Jesus has always said throughout his ministry, let us be like little children. Why? Because little children have a humble nature. They have a curiosity. They have a, a, a peacefulness that exudes from them. They have this joy that exudes from them. They haven't been tainted by the world with learning sinful behaviors. You know, Jesus has always said, let us become like children. Why? Because in repenting daily, then you can become like that little child before the time of learning the sinful knowledge and behavior of the world. When you become like a little child, you become humble. You become joyful. You become curious and excited to know the things of God. You are amazed at the wonderment of the omnipotence of God. And so it's no surprise that children love Jesus and Jesus loves children even today. And so I'll read this uh, passage here, Matthew chapter 18, verses two through four. It says, then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Well, here we go. Where Jesus is talking about the humility. Humble yourself as the little child. He says here, converted and become as little children or you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Did Jesus say here, trust on what I did on the cross alone? No, he did not say that. And we know the work, the finished work of Jesus on the cross is extremely important. Obviously, it's not to take anything away from the blood of Christ because by the blood of Christ, we are saved. I'm not saying to not recognize and have faith in and believe in the blood of Jesus and in what he did in his finished work because he is the truth, the way, and the life. What I am saying is that when you don't take everything that our God and our King has set forth, if you cherry pick and you take one part of the gospel, if you talk about repentance and you don't talk about the finished work of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the truth, the way, and the life, then you are dissecting and cherry picking the gospel. If you only talk about the finished work of Jesus, but you don't talk about repentance, then it's the same thing. You have to keep it in context in its entirety. Moving on before I close, in Mark chapter 10, verses 13 and 15, here it talks about Jesus blessing the little children and he wanted all the children to come forth so that he can touch them and bless them. And the disciples were rebuking those who were bringing the children. And when Jesus saw this, he was greatly pleased and said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for of such is the kingdom of God. What is he saying? The kingdom of God is for the little children. You may say, okay, well, I'm not a child, I'm a grown adult. Yes, but Jesus said, convert and become as little children. Be humble. Now in Revelation, let's see the glory of our God here. I always got to include that, you know, glory be to God, praise Jesus. In Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 16, it talks about Christ on a white horse. And I'll read this. It says, now I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, 
and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now you can see from this passage here what a wonderful passage it is, glory to God, praise Jesus. There are so many personality traits just written in this one small passage. Just in these few verses here, you can see a number of things that we've already gone over. And here we see that Jesus is exuding those traits. And so we know that, yes, he is to rule with a rod of iron. What is that rod of iron? It is the foundation, the holy standard, and the obedience of God that will shine forth. That will naturally be something that we can live by, that rod of iron that cannot be broken. It says that his mouth will go out. It will go out as a sharp sword and strike the nations. Well, when you see a preacher that has that Holy Spirit fire and those words repent for the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand, it will cut like a sharp sword to the heart. And those that have a heart after God will understand that that correction is God's love, his grace and his mercy shining down on them, allowing them to hear the word, even if it's, it sounds harsh to them because they're in their sin. Yes, when you're having things that are sinful broken off of you, it's going to hurt, it's going to be harsh. But you know what? When that's broken off of you, you will be light. Your burden will be light and easy and you'll be filled with peace and joy. You will be thankful and appreciative that the God of Israel, our Father in heaven, our Christ, reached down his hand and pulled you out of that dark pit and he wiped the mud off of your eyes so that you could see, so that you would no longer be blinded to the things of God. Could you imagine when you were walking in your sin and you were blinded to the things of God, that if you had died in that sin, that you would have gone to hell? Praise our God and our King that we are alive today. Each and every day that we wake up is grace upon our lives, that we have another day to be pleasing unto God. We have another day to repent unto him that we may go out and proclaim the gospel, that we will all be disciples of Jesus and proclaim the good news of the gospel, which is that 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1-4, through 4, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, that he was buried and he was raised from the dead on that third day, that we may be given the gift of salvation, and we will have grace through faith. What does that mean? That, that we will be, be shielded from the wrath of God, because our God is just and he is merciful. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the same God that with his own finger wrote those 10 commandments and had given them as a covenant to Moses, to the people, the Israelites who were brought out of Egypt, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so don't think that because we have this circumvented way of coming to the Father now, that God does not rain down his wrath. Oh no, he is still the same and he has not changed. But because he is merciful, in his justice he rains down that wrath, but in his mercy, we are given that grace to have an opportunity to repent. We have an opportunity, if it is in our heart, to be open and willing to the things of God. He will wipe our eyes clean so that we are no longer blinded. He will clean those ears of yours and mine so that we are not deaf to the word of God. Heaven forbid that his word goes out and it falls on deaf ears. It is God's heart that everyone will come into the knowledge of him. That is what he wants. When you look outside after a rainy day and there's a rainbow, it is a reminder of, of God's covenant to never 
flood the earth again. Why do you think the rainbow comes after rain? To show you that fear not, even though it rains, it's not going to flood again on the entire earth. To wipe out mankind so that it can be rebuilt. To wipe out that sin, that wrath of sin had to come. Let us remember the good things of our God. And let us remember that just as heaven is real and our God is real, hell is also real. And you don't want to find yourself in front of Jesus in that great day of judgment with him saying, I do not know you. Be open to the things of God. Yield yourself to the word of our Lord and our God. Get in your secret place, that closet, and pray to him and have that relationship and ask him to show you his spirit. Pray that it comes upon you so that you can be pulled out of your sin and out of that daily living of strife and grief. You will never know true joy and true peace. You will never know that unless you come into the knowledge of our Christ. And it starts with an open mind and a willing heart. And so with that said, I hope that you were able to draw some seeds and some nuggets of knowledge from this podcast today. I hope that this will start you on a curiosity to find out more traits of the personality of Jesus so that you can align yourself with his holy standard. Thank you for taking the time out to listen to this podcast today. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will go forth and proclaim the good news of the gospel according to God's will in his due time. And in Jesus' name, may you all be blessed. Until next time, bye friends.